everyone. Today I'm going to walk you through a real case study from my office. This is a 53-year-old woman who has Hashimoto's that we already know about, but she has an off-balance feeling and she has what we would call a visual vertigo. So again, she has an off-balance feeling. She has kind of an equilibrium issue uh, and she has difficulty walking in kind of busy visual environments. That's what we're getting at with the visual vertigo. Like in a store or, or unfortunately even outside, it begins to provoke this off-balance feeling. So sometimes we call that visual vertigo, sometimes you can call that visual motion sensitivity. So I'm going to walk you through this case, talk about what the workup was, uh, what her response was. So if you have Hashimoto's and some kind of vertiginous symptoms, if this sounds like you, I think you're going to find this video very helpful. All right, let's get into it. So I always start with the history, right? You guys know that the history is extremely important because a lot of times there are clues in the history that if you're paying attention, will tell you either what tests you need to do, or what tests you don't need to do, what are clues to the mechanism of what's happening with that patient. And so let's see what this case says to us. So in 2005, she was treated for Lyme disease. Now, a lot of times people get very excited and say, oh my God, Lyme disease, that must be what it is. Maybe, I mean, yeah, Lyme disease is a real issue, but we're not going to immediately think, oh my gosh, this is what it is. I mean, that was uh, 18 years ago, and that must be what caused the Hashimoto's. We're, we're going to calm down and just kind of see what it says. Now, that being said, uh, infections are very important because infections love to create cross-reactive antibodies, so they can be a trigger for autoimmunity, all right? Now, about uh, 43 years of age, about 10 years ago, she began developing perimenopausal symptoms. Now, remember, uh, Hashimoto's likes to turn on uh, puberty, pregnancy, perimenopause, of course, other times as well. But those are times that we know have some interesting uh, hormonal shifts that can promote the triggering of Hashimoto's if you've got the genetic predisposition. Now, that's also the time when she had this initial vestibular problem. Now, when you read this description, it sounds like maybe it might be BPPV, right? Because she was laying on her stomach, she turned over very quickly, and ever since then, ever since then, she's had this off-balance feeling. Now, maybe you think, well, you know, she just needs to have like an Epley's maneuver done, she needs to have like a vestibular rehab uh, sort of therapy done to her, and that would fix it. Well, let's see what happens. So she was diagnosed hypothyroid at that time. Now there's the trifecta, right? <laughs> so she's perimenopausal, diagnosed hypothyroid, and it's Hashimoto's. I'll just let the cat out of the bag. Uh, and she had these vestibular symptoms all start at the same time. And she was diagnosed uh, uh, with hypothyroidism, so her TSH must have been high, uh, T4, T3 low, and she was given levothyroxine, which is the standard sort of, you know, not a big deal. Like if you can't make the hormones, uh, it's a good thing that they make them so you can take them. She saw several doctors in the intervening years, right, between 10 years ago and now. She saw a neuro-ophthalmologist, you know, a real specialist, who said she had what we call a vertical heterophoria, which means her eyes uh, were kind of, one was pointed up and one was pointed in a slightly different direction, right, vertical heterophoria. Gave her some prism glasses, but that didn't help her symptoms, so that must not have been what it was. Uh, she started vestibular rehab therapy, uh, which helped a very small bit, as the words that she used. Uh, the vestibular therapist thought she might have vestibular migraine. Now, vestibular migraine is a real popular diagnosis over the last six or seven years, and her symptoms do not sound like vestibular migraine to me. I think a lot of people get overdiagnosed with that because people are, you know, practitioners are looking for a diagnosis to, to give the patient, and vestibular migraine is kind of broad enough that they get thrown in that kind of trash can. Now, vestibular migraine, the sporadic nature of the symptoms, that's, that just didn't seem to fit with this lady. Now, she had an MRI. Now, the MRI did show an incidental tumor and acoustic neuroma. Now, the tumor was a pituitary, a uh, little microadenoma, didn't really mean anything, uh, and an acoustic neuroma. Now, the acoustic neuroma, you know, you would think, oh my gosh, I bet that's what's causing it. However, it was super duper small and she didn't have any hearing loss, and so that ended up not being what it was. Now, another diagno uh, doctor diagnosed her with something called mal de debarkment syndrome, or MDDS. That's not a bad guess because MDDS basically means you've got, uh, you feel like you're on a boat, right? You're kind of swaying or tilting or something like that. It's not rotational like this or like this, but you got this kind of rocking, feeling like you're on a boat or on a waterbed. Also said she might have vestibular migraine and gave her an antidepressants, which, which she didn't take. <clears throat> now she's been taking Topamax, which is actually an anti-epileptic medication, for almost a year, uh, but that's not produced any changes as well. 
She had a VNG, a video nystagmography test. You know, they would put the goggles on you and they go through a battery of tests. But that was incomplete because she couldn't tolerate the caloric testing where they put the uh, warm and cold water or air in your ear. It's really, really unpleasant. Uh, but she's taking uh, levothyroxin. And the other tests that they did uh, besides the caloric were normal, which doesn't really tell you a lot, to be honest, because uh, a VNG battery looks at usually spontaneous nystagmus, optokinetic nystagmus, saccades and pursuits. And if all that stuff's normal, that doesn't mean she doesn't have a vestibular problem. It just means it doesn't have the source of what it doesn't have a source that that test is looking for, right? She could still have a metabolic problem for her symptoms. Now, family history is pretty significant for a mother who had breast cancer and a thyroid lobectomy, so I would be very interested about that. Now, I, years ago, um, I've been told that uh, Hashimoto's patients often would just get part of their thyroid taken out, and that was an attempt to, you know, uh, cure it. So that may be what happened to her mom. But her mom had breast cancer father had prostate cancer and a paternal grandmother who had breast cancer. So just from a, hey, I'm a healthcare practitioner standpoint, I'm interested in anything that pops on the radar that might give me a clue about her having cancer. Her symptoms don't make me think that, but now that I know that it's in her history. She has a few symptoms, potentially what we would call nocturnal hypoglycemia. I'm not really going to worry about that because that's not really into ending up being relevant to her case. Now her diet's not restricted. Now she knows uh, that she has Hashimoto's but her diet is unrestricted. And I can tell you that's an immediately actionable thing that we can, uh, we can do, right? We can change her diet because there are a couple of things that you really just should not be eating if you have Hashimoto's. Now, she had a couple labs uh, that were done two months prior and that showed thyroid peroxidase and thyroid globulin antibodies. So you can see right there, her thyroid peroxidase antibodies are 406, pretty high, right? So that's Hashimoto's, but Interestingly, her TSH, T3 are normal. So that is what we call euthyroid Hashimoto's. And I have plenty of videos on this because for years and years and years, I've been uh, telling people that you don't have to be overtly hypothyroid from your Hashimoto's for the Hashimoto's to be causing you a problem. And research comes out every month showing that, yeah, all you have to have is elevated antibodies, which is a sign of immune system dysfunction in order for you to feel bad, in order for it to start messing with things. Because remember, having an autoimmune problem like Hashimoto's is like having an octopus sitting on your back and it's got its tentacles in all different corners of your biochemistry. And you don't have to be overtly full-blown hypothyroid for the Hashimoto's process to be messing with things. It's really, really important. Uh, endocrinology can't really seem to well, they only really have one tool, right? And if you don't really need hormones, like this lady doesn't really need hormones, then they say, well, we'll follow up in a year. And if, then if you're hypothyroid, <laughs> you know, we'll give you hormones. But there's a lot of things you can do before then, right? A lot of things you can do uh, to perhaps even prevent you from going from euthyroid uh, to overt hypothyroid. And again, let me just make sure. Euthyroid means uh, the TSH and the T4, T3 are normal. So euthyroid Hashimoto's means you have the antibodies, but the TSH, T4, T3 are normal. Now, the next step from that, uh, I was just talking to a young lady about this today, is subclinical Hashimoto's hypothyroid, which is kind of a weird name because in that scenario, you got the antibodies, the TSH is high, and that's it. The T4, T3 are not abnormal. And then the step after that is full-blown, overt hypothyroid. That's where the TSH is high, the T4, T3 is low, and you have the antibodies. All right, now, she had limited resources, so only a regular blood chemistry was ordered. Right now, do I do $5,000 worth of testing on everybody? Absolutely not. We work within the patient's resources and what, you know, diagnostically we realistically need. So we ordered her labs. Her labs come back, and here's what we see. Now, the first thing you see up here is you see a homocysteine level that's, that's high. Homocysteine, not a big deal. We all have it as long as you're recycling it. So B12, folic acid, those are the main nutrients you use to recycle homocysteine. There's some others. Uh, when homocysteine starts to pile up, though, it becomes very inflammatory, pro-oxidative, bad for cardiovascular health, makes your brain fire faster, and it's just generally inflammatory. So we don't know why hers is elevated, but it definitely is, and we need to deal with that. Uh, you can see the, la the lipid panel here. The total cholesterol is 246, triglycerides 210, LDL 156. Now, does that have anything to do with how she feel? I mean, it might, but probably not. But again, as being, you know, a frontline uh, provider here, her lipids are high, we might want to do something about that, not necessarily pharmaceutically based. Now, again, you can see the TSH, T4, all that stuff is normal. So she is euthyroid again. 
Okay. And what else do we see? Well, her ferritin is a nine. Now let me just, let me say that. That's very, very bad. Uh, ferritin is a substance that, uh, it's iron basically. It's your best marker for iron. It reflects 22% of your body's iron. It is the thing you look at to tell you about is someone's iron level sufficient or not. Now you can see here that the lab range says, you know, 16 to 232 is, you know, normal. Well, it's not, I can just tell you that, that you know, below 50 if you're a cycling woman is really not good. Nine is bad, very bad. Now, what do you need iron for? Well, you need iron for making hemoglobin. You need iron for making uh, your thyroid hormones work correctly, thyroid peroxidase. You need iron for dopamine. You need iron, it's a very essential nutrient. So that's gonna have to get fixed. Now, does that specifically have anything to do with this off-balance feeling in the Hashimoto's? Uh, maybe if she's anemic, but she's not anemic. Uh, but there is definitely, that's a problem. We're going to have to fix that. Next thing we see is her folate or folic acid 6.5. Now, again, that is not good. For me, anything below like 11, 12 is not good. Yes, the lab range says, hey, you know, uh, you know, anything above 5.4 is okay, but that's not okay. The research is pretty clear when you're 10, 9, 8, that is bad. Now, my antenna are starting to prick up because I'm seeing iron not good, folate not good, vitamin D not good. Now vitamin D being low, you see that all the time in people with autoimmune conditions. It seems to be part of the genetic package. Uh, vitamin D is anti-inflammatory, it's immune system regulatory, but I'm seeing three things here and I'm starting to wonder if she might have a malabsorption problem. Is there some process going on in her small intestine that is preventing her from absorbing some of these nutrients. Now, if she does have one, the most common thing that that would be would be celiac disease or non-celiac wheat sensitivity. Uh, however, I don't think she has that. Uh, she might, we didn't test for it, she didn't have the money for it, but nonetheless, she's got three nutrient deficiencies. They've, they're all gonna have to get corrected, right? We know she has an autoimmune inflammatory process. So treatment-wise, what we're gonna have to do is fix the deficiencies, we're gonna have to do a a short-term anti-inflammatory repair diet, and I'm not going to tell you what it is because I don't want you trying to treat yourself so nobody throw, you know, tomatoes at the screen. Uh, I don't want you to do these things. I, I'm, the reason I don't tell people, well, hey, here's exactly what I did, because then they run out and try to go self-treat, and I'm really not for that. I really think you need to be working with a professional who's trained, who has experience, and let that person guide you, not try to treat yourself. Um, I don't really recommend you trying to buy a book and treat yourself because you need to find someone who can treat you like you, right? Do the test that you need, interpret the test, your results, not just sort of do a sort of a shotgun, you know, uh, protocol. So we do an anti-inflammatory immune regulatory supplement protocol, and let's see how she does. So after 30 days, she tells me the off-balance feeling and this kind of visual sensitivity to the busy environment's 80% improved. She's been able to do walk her dog one mile every day. She hasn't been able to do that in over a year, okay? Just imagine you can't take your dog for a walk because when you do, the visual surrounding provokes in you this feeling of being off balance as if you're gonna fall. Now she could, use, before this, before we did this, before this 30 days, she could go to the end of the block and back, but she had to use like a little walking stick or a cane and she's 53. I mean, she doesn't have Parkinson's, she doesn't have arthritis, but what she's got is a vestibular problem. Um, that is making it difficult for her to move in her environment. You know, and this is stuff that you and I take for granted, but if it happens to you, uh, it becomes really painfully clear. Now, as a bonus, she's lost 15 pounds. That's not why we did any of this. Uh, the, I'll just tell you this, a lot of times when people are losing weight, because we're not starving her, right? That's not the point. When you de-inflame people, burning fat becomes a lot, lot easier. Now, I'll, just, I'll read a little email that she sent me uh, 30 days after, after we got into this, she goes, hey, I can't thank you enough for how much you've helped me in a month's time. Uh, when I first reached out to you, I was desperate for help. I have Hashimoto's and high antibodies, which have never been addressed by any doctors I've seen. They just put me on thyroid medication. Uh, my symptoms have always been the feeling of off balance, problems with walking, especially in stores or malls. I've seen numerous doctors was diagnosed with vestibular migraines, but wasn't getting any relief from the medication they put me on. Uh, you're the only doctor who addressed my Hashimoto's. You did thorough blood work, gave me a food plan, the proper supplements. In 30 days, I'm walking a mile a day. That's great. I mean, that's really good. For 30 days in, that's really good. But we care about how she's doing at 60 days and 90 days, right? So let's check that out. So after 60 days, 
uh, we do some retest of her labs. Now check that out. Total cholesterol has gone down 33 points. HDL still needs to come up. Triglycerides are looking good. LDL has gone down 11 points. This is nice. We like this. Vitamin D has went from a 22 to an 84. And that's not high. That's not dangerous. That's very, very good. Her ferritin, right, which was single digits, that's gone up 20 points, which is excellent. <laughs> that's a really, really nice jump. And her folic acid, her folate's gone from 6.5 to 22. So I know the things I'm giving her, she's absorbing, right? And I know based on her symptom response that something is working, right? Most likely it's a combination of things. It's a combination of down-regulating the immune system process of the Hashimoto's. And again, that's the lab that we did at 60 days. And she's like, she says, I I'm almost 100% asymptomatic. She can go places. She's lost 25 pounds. She's doing like completely night and day. She's been able to reintroduce several of the foods that we had been eliminating on that repair diet. And after 90 days, right, we're three months into it now. Now it's when we can start to feel like, okay, maybe we did a good job. She's still doing great, right? She's almost 100% asymptomatic. She'd be getting, now we're going to start beginning to pare down what she's taking to find out, okay, does she really still need to be taking the things I'm giving her? Because one of, one of the things I do is I say, you know, at anything I tell somebody to take, at some point I'm probably going to tell them to not take it to see if they still need it, right? I just don't think you should take something forever unless you've got a really demonstrated reason uh, to do that. Now, why did I make this video? Well, I made the video to show you that you have options, right? Uh, if you see yourself uh, as, as this patient, or you know someone who does, there are options. You have choices. You don't have to settle. You don't have to suffer. But the problem is, or not the problem, or the hurdle is, you got to find someone who can analyze your case, know what tests to order, know how to interpret those tests, know how to do the treatment, how to follow up and find out if the treatment's working. And those people are there. You got to look for them. So make sure that you're working with someone that understands all these things we just talked about, right? That's a lot, right? The immune system, the vestibular system, the Hashimoto's, the connection, what to do about it. But just know that even if you've been suffering like this woman was for 10 years, you can get better if you get the right treatment from the right doctor. Okay, I'll see you next time.